and you may start anytime. Have a good session. Okay. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session on attacks and defenses. We will have six sessions on, um, um, yeah, well, attacks on defenses. You will be surprised. Uh, the first uh, talk is going to be given by uh, Lukasz Kmielewski. And the, the title of the, the work is Fault Injection as an Oscilloscope for Fault Correlation Analysis. Uh, it's a joint work with Abel Spite, Alyssa Milburn, and Lukasz Um If you have questions, please use the Zulip chat. Try to use the Zulip chat. Uh, we are monitoring there um, a bit more carefully. The floor is yours, Lukasz. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Barish. Okay. Okay, um, I will talk about um, uh, fault injection as an oscilloscope, fault correlation analysis. This is a short version of the presentation that was uh, given before. Um, uh, this is uh, work done by Albert Sprout, Alisa Milburn, and me, uh, Łukasz Chmielewski. On this, uh, on this slide, we see on the left side uh, an oscilloscope, a common tool for side channel analysis. And on the right side, we see uh, uh, our fault injection tool. Uh, in the oscilloscope on the screen, we see some traces, presumably side channel traces from power analysis, for example. And um, we will see how we can achieve similar traces using, uh, using fault injection. Actually, these traces in the oscilloscope, they are coming from fault injection. So uh, first, let me explain what we the, 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 the main idea is to construct probability traces from faults. So the fact that fault, um, fault probability is dependent on the data being processed by a device, that's a well-known uh, fact already for more than 10 years. That's also true, of course, for operation. Uh, so then their data are much different that, is, that are being processed. What we do is we transform a voltage uh, fault injection uh, uh, fault injection tool, fault injection device into one bit sampling oscilloscope, and then we build these so-called probability traces from that. Let us have a look at the bottom. There, there is blue trace. That is uh, just a power trace from our target. Uh, this is more or less first round of, uh, of AES. So how could we get something presumably similar using fault injection? We essentially at each point in time in this, in this, uh, in this spectrum given here in the X axis, we run 15,000 uh, fault injection attempts per point. And then we see how many, we, we just built a bar chart, how many successful fault injections were there or how many were not there. And then when we move uh, on in, in time domain on X axis from left to right, we discover that the probabilities are different. And effectively the, the, the trace that we are getting, I, I hope it's visible, is, is, is quite similar. Uh, of course, the, the, the problem is that a lot of attempts are necessary, but, but the result could be similar. And the separate question is, what does it mean that uh, our fault injection was successful or not? Uh, one, common, uh, one common concept in, in, in related work was so-called success probability. So just checking whether the, cipher, the return ciphertext is correct for our, in our case for, for AES, whether the return ciphertext is correct or not. Um, that's a, that's a common approach. So there is no need to know the ciphertext, but there is a need to know whether it was correct. That's uh, that's a well-known uh, metric. The other um, thing that we investigated in the paper is mute probabilities of just whether the device answered or not. If the device um, didn't answer, then we assume that it's it's success. And it occurred that if we choose the parameters still quite um, in quite generic way, it's still even that is sufficient to generate such traces around the attacks. If, let us have a fast look at RSA. So that's just characterization trace of, of, of RSA. This is a simple square and multiply implementation. So here operation leakage should be revealing bits. And indeed, this, this uh, I, I believe in light green, we marked zeros and the 
a dark blue is, um, is, is, is ones. So in this case, we are able to recognize uh, zero from ones using fault injection. Uh, we, and then, yeah. So this is translation of simple power analysis to simple fault analysis. In case of AES, so in case of, let's say, CPA approach, we, we did a very similar approach. We collect the traces and we run uh, correlation analysis on that. And uh, for both for the successes and for mutes, we were able to, uh, to recover all the key bytes. Um, in case of mutes, we needed slightly more traces. So on this example, let's say 30 million, while 20 million were enough. In the case of successes, this is natural since successes intuitively should give us more information. Um, because in case of muted mutes, a lot of times we will just, uh, let's say, um, uh, make the device reset uh, regardless what's happening with crypto. Okay, we also, in the paper, we present other results for uh, three other implementations. We also analyze, um, so as we see, there are a lot of faults necessary, but we also analyze uh, what if you would know more or less exactly where to glitch, then we need slightly less um, less uh, faults. In one case, we didn't recover all the key bytes. We recovered 14. So we, we believe we didn't collect enough traces. To conclude, we have presented a generic technique for translating a CA into FI attacks on the example of simple fault analysis and correlation fault analysis. One is based on SPA, the other one on CPA. We have two, we use two different classification assumptions, mutes and successes. Mutes were introduced in this uh, in, the, in this paper, showing that I mean introduced in a way that it shows that the attack still works. Uh, we attacked successfully cryptographic libraries running on three different targets, and we also presented proof of concept results against hardware engine. Our priority was to have a generic and practical attack. Uh, drawback was is relatively many uh, fault injection attempts. Details can be found in the paper or in the full presentation. Uh, what's omitted here is the, the, the proof of concept results against hardware engine. We didn't also discuss what's presented in the paper. So uh, collision attacks and linear regression analysis. We also did proof of concept here. I omitted also our low cost uh, voltage fault injection uh, uh, setup details about that. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah, I skipped here related work because it's uh, it's quite uh, long and there is no time. And I think it's time for questions. Thank you, Vukash. It was a very interesting uh, observation and thanks for the in-time presentation. Okay. I don't see questions at the moment, but um, I'm, I'm curious about one thing. Um, let's say... Let's take the attack on uh, on the AES uh, that you did. Yeah, uh, yeah. How would your attack compare to statistical fault analysis in terms of number of experiments required? Would it require less or more uh, than your methods? So um, I, I mean the the, the main uh, why why it would be hard to compare, I guess, is because in the statistical fault. Um, uh, in, in, in the attack that you mentioned, you do need, uh, you, you attack, for example, 32 bit at the same time. In our attack, we actually attack S-Box out. I think there is a very, very strong relation. So if we would attack after the, the mix columns, for example, and then try to do 32 bit attack, and we would have a, um, so, so we, we took a bit more, uh, let's say, at the cost of many faults, we took practical approach. So first of all, we do we for sure would need a lot of faults if we don't know exactly where to attack. If we if we would know if you would have perfect control, um, I'm uh, I, I'm I'm not totally sure, but I would expect to be not completely different. Let's say uh, it, it should be at least related intuitively. It's, uh, but 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 what we shown um, we needed a lot of faults already attacking S box out, but on one hand, it was due to not having perfect control over the target, I believe. So hard to hard to say, but I would hope it would be similar if we attack similar intermediates. Thank you. Uh, in the meantime, another question popped up on Zulip chat, but um, regarding time, I think 
it's better if we move on and if we have time left at the end of the session uh we will get back uh to that question otherwise okay. uh feel free to to answer on the zulip chats okay i will yeah thank you thanks again for the presentation the next talk uh title uh, is denial of service on FPGA based cloud in infrastructure, attack and defense. It's a uh, joint work between uh, Tuan La, uh, Kua Pam, uh, Joseph Powell, uh, Dirk Koch. And uh, uh, the talk will be given by Tuan La. Let me share my screen. Hi. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Tuan from the University of Manchester. So today I'm going to present our study about denial of service on FPGA by cloud infrastructure. And in this brief presentation, we'll go through the key points in our study. So first is first, what's the power hammering attacks? So is any kind of attack that aim to draw a substantial power consumption to make the system unstable or even shut down? So to give you some numbers, only 10% of lookup table resources in data center FPGA could draw up to 350 watt of power. Why? The reason is simple, because a ring oscillator could run up to 6 GHz, which is 60 times faster than normal running frequency of an FPGA. So all of that translate to X kilowatt of power hammering potential. So to give you a comparison, the sun emits 6.3 kilowatt per square centimeter. So our number here is not far away. So the flexibility of FPGAs allow us to design a cell oscillating circuit out of a few components. Like in this example here, we have a lookup table acting as an inverter and a couple of multiplexer to connect input to output. Then we have a cell oscillator. That's the reason why cloud service provider like AWS doesn't want us to upload the BStream directly and program the FPGA freely. Instead, they want us to upload the design so that they can inspect, then raise the BStream and program it onto the FPGA fabric owned by themselves. And even if something goes wrong, there's runtime monitor to minimize the physical damage to the system. Because access to FPGA is restricted and Amazon doesn't give us any physical identity of the FPGA ball, so we need to find a way to fingerprint the FPGA instant before doing any attacks. So here's the counter by path, and it should be noted that we don't have any security requirement for this path, and it's just for fingerprinting only. The right figure here shows an example of path responses. Two lines below are for one instance at different power level. The other line is for a different instance. Power or heat really affects the path response of the first instance. And there's a theory that uh, someone could use that to, to know if the instance was previously used and review the scheduling policy of FPGA in data center. There are many ring oscillators that pass the design inspection. So once we have ring oscillator in, how do we bypass the runtime monitor? For example, the clock gating when power reach the upper limit. Well, we do that by having our own ring oscillator as a clock source. Next, we have a chain of ring oscillator to ramp up power over time and a counter to calibrate how fast power is rising. So later on, we could estimate power even when we lose the connection to the ball. In fact, some experiments show that the shutdown sequence not only power up the FPGA ball, but it also frees the hot machine, and that's the problem. So here we did the experiment with and without crashing the instant, and the result is without crashing, we got the next instant like immediately within five minutes, However, when crashing the instant, we saw the time increase dramatically up to more than 12 hours. And the minimum time to get the same fabric reallocated is about like 52 minutes. Finally, let's talk about countermeasure. 
So our FPJ defender here is able to generate the netlist from both midstream and design check spoil. And <clears throat> that netlist is uh, checked for malicious design, for example, ring oscillator and some other placement violation. And um, finally, it's up to the configuration manager to decide if the design is safe enough to be loaded onto the fabric. And additional to this, we also have a custom DRCs to detect ring oscillator. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask or contact us afterward. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Swan, um, to the well, introduction to your uh, paper. Um, are there any questions? Uh, I cannot see any on the on the Zulu chat yet, but I'm I'm curious about <coughs> one uh, observation you made. So you had this observation of fingerprinting. Um, is this something special to the APJs that are used on Amazon servers, or is this some genetic property that you have observed on other APJs as well? <coughs> So for the fingerprinting, we, we want, so first we, we fingerprint on the instance without pressing the instance. So we have a database of the instance is used on a specific like uh, reason on, uh, on the service. Then, uh, uh, the, um, then we do the attack. Then uh, we, we know like exactly which instance is up or down and how long does it take for one instance. Uh, I mean, one uh, same fabric to be reallocated. So that's the reason why we use a puff for fingerprinting. Does it answer the question? Yeah, but I'm, I'm curious whether it also applies to, to other kind of FPGAs. Like, I'm curious whether you try it in uh, other services maybe, or uh, maybe in-house in the lab. Uh, yes. So uh, the frequency, uh, the ring oscillator frequency depends highly on the temperature and it uh, actually apply to any other FPGAs. Yeah, we already tried it on our own like in-house FPGA, yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, we still have some time, but I don't see any other questions yet. Um, maybe if uh, questions pop up later, um, I will get back to you, Swan. Thanks for the talk. Okay, thank you. And the next talk uh, is titled uh, DAPA, Differential Analysis Aided Power Attack on Nonlinear Feedback Shift Registers. Uh, it's a joint work with uh, uh, of Xiaoming uh, Sim, Diamanto Yap. Uh, Shivan Basin and Xiaoming is going to uh, give the talk. Okay. Floor is yours, Xiaoming. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I will share the screen now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I will give a very quick background and motivation, followed by the high level idea of DAPA and then uh, the application of it on uh, the King scheme called the LR key mail and a very short experimental results. So uh, my talk will be quite brief. So for more information, you can look at the full video. Okay. So first, uh, this was inspired by the a DPA uh, presented in COSAC 2017. So it's based on the observation that uh, more power will be needed to flip a bit value inside the register. So what they did was to have two IVs with a difference at certain bits value and you run both of them and take the power trace and you simply take the difference of the power trace to learn the information about the neighboring bits. So to give a small core example, so suppose that uh, you have this computation. So the now the IV bit is zero. And you can see that with the left shift, there will be two bits that has to change the value. And if you were to inject a difference at this position, now three bits will need to change the value because the 
the newest bit now become one. So by comparing these two power traces, you can see that there's an increase in the power difference. And from there, we can deduce that the, two bit, the newest two bits are equal of value. So just by observing the rise and drop of the power difference, we can deduce the relationship between the neighboring bits. And if you can do that, then just by guessing one bit, you are able to deduce the, the bit value of the other bit. So basically you get a one bit information. So this uh, DPA was applied on a key mail, which is a Reking scheme that claims to be side channel secure. And here you can see there are four nonlinear shift register in the four blade, the fan blades. And they, they are loaded with the 128 bit secret key. And also there will be an IV that's updating all these four uh, shift registers. And each of them will have independent IV bits uh, introduced to them, as you can see in the figure here. So using the DPA, the authors were able to recover the, all the relations within each shift registers. And all it needs now is to guess one bit value and you can retrieve the entire internal stage of each of the fan blade. Okay, so this was the previous work. So the designer of our chemo actually proposed an updated scheme. So now each IB bits now updates all the four registers at the same time. So instead of having observing a single rise of four in the power difference, now there are all these different cases that could happen simultaneous, uh, that could happen. So for example, if you don't see any power difference, then it means that two, two out of the four of them has equal bit relation and the other two has non-equal bit relations, but you do not know the distribution of them. So this creates some ambiguity to the guessing of the relations. And using this design, they claim to have a 67.9 bit security. So the motivation of our work is that we observe that this uh, 67.9 is an average upper bound rather than a guaranteed lower bound. And the original DPA does not consider the feedback function that's being used for each of the fan blade. So the natural question was, are we able to obtain more information if we consider the feedback function? And if we let the differential to propagate further into the shift registers. So that gives rise to our DAPA attack. So one of the property that we did was to study the various differential patterns and their expected power. So this allows us to deduce more bit relations. So using back the previous example just now, so we, we can able to we are able to deduce the relation between uh, these first two bits. But if we actually let it propagate for another round, we can also see that uh, we are able to deduce another relation by observing the next uh, power difference in the next cycle. So if they are different, then as you can see here, if the second relation is equal, then we expect a, a two unit increment. While if the second bit is different, then we will expect a similar power difference for the case. So with the same uh, input different bit, we are able to deduce more information if we let it propagate further. There's also other uh, property that we can gain from nonlinear component of the shift register. So, but this is the main idea that we are using. So the high level idea of the DAPA is to first do an offline uh, work to determine what differential pattern that we want to uh, get to retrieve the most information possible. And then we perform the online phase, which is to inject the differences and uh, sorry, to choose the IV with the various differences and measure the power traces. And finally, using these power traces and we compare the differences, we are able to learn the information about the internal state. Okay, so on the application to LR chemo, so for easier reference, we we, we express this chemo into the, uh, the image on the right side. So each row here is uh, one of the fan blades. Okay, so now uh, similar to original attack, we inject a difference in the IV. So now because all four will be updated at the same time, so there's some ambiguity in 
which one has the equal and which one has the non-equal relation. But if we just let these different propagates further in, because the shift registers are different, some of the uh, feedback will be earlier than the other. So for this case, the F4 will have the feedback before the rest of them. So end up we have this uh, single bit update here. And so at the right timing, we're able to isolate the difference and still learn some bit relations uh, with a definite answer to it. So there's no ambiguity now whether which one is equal and which one is not. So, and the feedback position depends on the cycle that we are at. So this bit will go to different position and we are eventually, we can retrieve all the relations needed. So the, on the application of DAPA on the LRT mill, with 36 chosen IVs, we can recover the entire internal state of the uh, LRT mill. And so we are reduced back to the four bit key guessing. And among the 128-bit IV, uh, we only need the first 36-bit. And the next 11 bits, we fix it to be some concern to avoid additional differential introduced to the state. So we actually have 81 bits of freedom to, uh, to, to have the non-respecting scenario and to generate more traces with similar power, uh, to generate more uh, same power traces to filter the noise. So uh, in our experiment, we have this set up and our focus is at this uh, instruction during the move instruction, which is to update the, the registers. So this one is- Shaming, uh, we are yeah. continuing to the time of the other presenters. Can you um, oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, try to wrap up? Last slide. Yeah, this is the last slide. So the dotted line here above is the simulator difference and from our real measurement, we are able to see that indeed we have the matching result. So we could identify the differences. Yeah. So that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for the talk. And um, yeah, excuse me for the interruption. I... <laughs> oh, yeah, so sorry for. I thought it was going on. <laughs> okay. Um... Right now, we don't have any questions. We're also running a bit over. Um, yeah, but one one question, maybe very quick question. Um, how um, how difficult your experiments will be if, uh, if you were to use a more noisier target, let's say? Did you do these experiments to see like how we can overcome the challenges in a noisier setup? Because yeah, it uh, seems your attack is uh, quite uh, noise sensitive. Yeah, correct. So, uh, so you also depend on the target that we are dealing with. So, for instance, for this LRK mill, we have eighty-one bits of freedom. So, we can still have select. Uh, we can generate more traces with the same power difference to filter all this noise. Yeah. So, for this particular case, we have a lot of freedom there. Yeah. So, it's algo dependent in that case. Okay. Well, thanks again for the talk. And uh, we will get back to you if there are questions on the Zulu chat later. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lauren, the floor is yours for the rest of the Thanks. Talk. So the next talk is timing black box attacks, crafting adversarial examples through data dependent timing leaks against DNNs on embedded devices. It's a joint work uh, between Tsunato Nakai, Daisuke Suzuki, and Tageshi Fujino. Uh, Tsunato, the floor is yours. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, hello, I'm Tsunata Nakai for Mitsubishi Electric Corporation. I would like to talk about our paper, Timing Black Box Attacks, Crafting the Advisor Example to Timing Weeks Against DNN on Emit Devices. This is where I showed a quick overview of my talk. Uh, we focused on advisor example AEs. We introduced the first attack to crack the AE that is based on the differential processing time according to the input data on DNNs. The problem is that crafting the AE needs some information about the target DNN model. But our attack uses only processing time on DNN. Our contribution, uh, we propose a novel block of attack to craft AEs by using signature ink. We identified two relationships uh, between the processing time and the number of activated nodes and, and between the 
a number of activated nodes and AEs. And we qualify the cause of our attack by implementing a countermeasure to predict, uh, to prevent the timing weeks. This slide shows the sweat model uh, about our attack. Uh, we focused on DNN on embedded devices. So in case of DNN, uh, in case of embedded devices, attackers can measure the surgical information such as uh, processing time. Uh, we assume two security functions for embedded devices, uh, model encryption and uh, confidence deduction. So the attacker managed to crack the AE by using the only input data or, and output label uh, due to the, the, the countermeasure. And we focused on the side chain week. The goal is that the attackers craft AEs on the target devices, device, and then the input the, the AEs to other devices for misclassification. I'm explaining our approach. Uh, in related work, Bartina reported that some types of activation functions have different processing time depending on the input data. For example, the red function, that is the activation function, uh, indicated two cycles as differential processing time between the activated and non-activated. So TA is longer than TNA. That is the uh, timing week of activation function. Our attack is based, based on this, uh, this week. Now uh, we, we can, uh, observe the change in number of activated nodes from the timing leaks of activation function. For example, in case of a DNN with rel function, the DNN with more active activated nodes, a uh, right one, is more time consuming due to the timing weeks. So TX2 is longer than TX1 uh, because of TA is longer than TNA. This is the relationship between the processing time and number of activated nodes. Next, I'm explaining the number of activated nodes and AEs. Increasing number of activated nodes affects the output probability because of increasing the number of propagated, propagated values. For example, in case of DNN, the DNN, uh, if the number of activated nodes increase, then the output probability of correct travel is more affected than output probability of a fear activated node. This is a relationship between the number of activated nodes and AEs. So uh, the strategy of our attack is firstly, we add a small perturbation to the a part of input data, and then we measure the processing time of prediction. Finally, we cracked a aid with bad timing weeks to increase the number of activated nodes. This slide showed the experimental result. The graph showed the histogram of successful attacks to MMP model on uh, MCU. The data showed the perturbation bound until the misclassification is caused. The compared with random noise under the same condition without the, using time output probability, our attack tend to craft AE with small perturbations compared with the random noise. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tsunatu. Um, that was a very clear talk. Uh, I don't see any questions yet um, in the Zulip. Um, so maybe I'll, um, I'll ask for a clarification for myself to see if I understood correctly. So you applied little perturbations to part of the input and you measured the processing times and you only kept the perturbations that increased the processing times. Is that how you create the AEs? Yes. Okay, thank you. I understood correctly then. Um, then, uh, then I think we'll move on to the next talk um, since there are no questions yet and um, we do still have two talks to go through. So thank you, Tsunatu. Thank you. 
The next talk is uh, countermeasures against static power attacks, uh, comparing exhaustive logic balancing and other protection schemes in 28 nanometer CMOS. Um, this is a work from Torben Moz and Amir Morari, and Torben will give the talk. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction and welcome to this short presentation of our paper dealing with countermeasures against static power attacks. Um, so what is the problem? Why do we even have to care about static power attacks? And the answer is clear if you look at the leakage current of standard cells in CMOS technology. Here, for example, is a NOR gate in 22 nanometer CMOS technology. And you can see that for inputs A1 equals zero and A2 equals one, the uh, current leaked by the standard cell is more than four times larger than for A1 equals one and A2 equals one. So there's a very strong data dependency that um, the standard cells leak about the inputs that are applied to it in a stable state. You can observe essentially the same thing with uh, flip-flops, so with memory cells in your technology. Here is the only difference that it does not only leak about the inputs, but also about the output Q. Um, and now we have tested a number of uh, countermeasures, which we evaluate for the ability to prevent the extraction of secrets through the static power consumption. And the very first one here is barely a countermeasure. It's mainly a design technique. Um, namely the use of high threshold voltage cells. In modern device technology, standard cells often exist in multiple versions with different threshold voltages, and the cells with a higher threshold voltage switch slower, but they also consume a lower standby power. And so implementing a cryptographic primitive using only the high threshold voltage cells with minimum drive strength, for example, uh, might reduce the exploitable signal ava to, available to a static power as well as B. So this is a very simple first one. The second one that we took a look at is random start index shuffling, also pretty simple countermeasure. Um, for our serialized present architecture with our random start index, we simply select with which S-box of the 16 in each round we start so that um, S-box zero in the first round is computed at different and unpredictable points in time um, so that the adversary doesn't know where exactly it's processed. The third one is symmetric dual rail logic, which has been proposed in the literature. Um, and it's very simple. You duplicate each logic gate and the duplicated logic gate receives completely inverted inputs. This doesn't get rid of the whole uh, data dependency through the leakage current, but it's able to reduce it a little bit. Um, then we have quadruple algorithmic symmetrizing, also quad seal. Um, there you quadruple the circuit, so you have four instances, and in three of them you modify the S boxes so that you can run the circuits on the inputs keys, inverted inputs and inverted keys. And they are rotated in such a manner that all the hemming states, hemming weights and distances in your circuit are balanced. And finally, exhaustive logic balancing, with a, which is a contribution of this work. It um, takes the SDRL, so the symmetric rural logic, to another level um, by really exhaustively balancing the inputs to each gate. Here, for example, the NOR gate. For each NOR gate where that receives a 0, 0, there's also one which receives a 0, 1 one that receives a one zero and another one that receives a one one so that you as an attacker cannot distinguish and the leakage should be constant under the assumption that each instance of the same cell leaks exactly the same. This is of course not exactly true in reality because of intraday process variations, because of pass imbalances and because of um, aging effects, but it's still a good approximation. For the D flip flop, it gets more complicated and we cannot apply the same trick because we have an output that it depends on. So we cannot just apply a value to the output, but we have to choose the inputs as a function of the outputs. And we have to implement this function also with balanced gates. So the overhead is quite significant. Um, then we have mixed all those hiding countermeasures with the masking countermeasure, namely a simple threshold implementation. In this case, a three share threshold implementation of present um, and implemented all of those um, single countermeasures and also the combined countermeasures on a 28 nanometer ASIC prototype that we developed for this purpose. 
it's only 1.4 times 1.4 millimeter large, so it's really tiny. Um, and here are the post layout area consumptions of all the countermeasure circuits and also the unprotected circuits, which are called high performance here um, on this exact chip. Uh, we have listed also the overhead factors as you can see directly which countermeasures come at a very significant overhead and which are very expensive, uh, which are less expensive. So the random start index shuffling, for example, is pretty cheap also when it's combined with the threshold implementation, but the balancing based countermeasures are very expensive. Um, so this is our setup. We have used a source, source measure unit to um, supply the ASIC with the voltage and measure the current that is drawn inside a climate chamber at a higher temperature because it increases the leakage current. Here are some fixed versus fixed leakage assessment result. On the left side, the unmasked circuits. On the right side, the masked circuits. We can see that only the combination of threshold implementation and exhaustive logic balancing um, does not leak any detectable information uh, after 500,000 traces. We also performed a text. Here are the data complexities, which means the number of traces required to extract the key. And um, in absolute values, the threshold implementation plus exhaustive logic balancing is the most secure one. But because it's also the most expensive one, it's not the most uh, cost efficient one. That one would be the threshold implementation plus shuffling, um, which has the highest score in data complexity per gate equivalence. Yes, so in summary, neither hiding alone nor masking alone seem to protect sufficiently against this threat. So strong protection can only be achieved with combined countermeasures. And the costs in terms of area overhead are pretty significant if you have to do this. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Torben. Uh, there's one question on the Zulip chat uh, from Ravi Singh. He says, nice talk. What are your thoughts on static power causing a leakage problem or not for process nodes less, lesser than 22 nanometers? Uh, I didn't quite get the question. A leakage problem? Um, your static power causing a leakage problem or not for smaller process nodes? I mean, less, static smaller power... than 22. Static power is essentially a le leakage problem. Yes. And uh, <laughs> of course it, it scales. So in smaller nanometer technologies, it becomes more significant. So if you're above 100 nanometer structures then you don't have to care about this um, threat model because it, it's really not that relevant, but for smaller nanometer technologies, it becomes worse and worse. I hope this kind of answers this question. Um, and then I think I have a question myself. Um, so you compared the different countermeasures in terms of area. Um, I was wondering how do they compare in timing, uh, both for like critical path and in, in like number of clock cycles? Yeah, the critical path is affected. Um, this is also listed in the paper. Uh, the number of clock cycles is indeed not affected by any of them. So the TI needs a few more clock cycles than the normal ones, but all the masked ones need the same number of clock cycles and all the unmasked ones as well. And okay, the critical path you. is uh, in a reasonable range affected. So the area overhead is really the, the, the most significant one. And then um, maybe a quick answer for Ingrid. Um, she asks, did you control the routing? Is this standard cell design? It's completely standard cell design and the routing has been done by the tool. So we didn't manually route anything. Okay, thank you. Then uh, let's move on to the last talk of this session, uh, which is Fiverr, robust verification of countermeasures against fault injections, the joint work of Jan Richter Brockman, Ayn Rezaei Shamirzadi, Pascal Sazdrich, Amir Moradi and Tim Guneshu, and Jan will give the talk. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, and as you mentioned, I will going to talk about Fiverr, which is a joint work with Ayn Rizal Shamizadi, Pascal Zastrik, Amin Moradi, and Tim Gineso. And yeah, as cryptographic algorithms implemented on hardware devices like ASICs or FPGAs can be broken by fault injection attacks, our community came up with a plethora of countermeasures. However, it's still an open question how we can verify such countermeasures. And the state of the art is currently to use Verfi, which was proposed last year. 
And Rafi is the first automated open source cryptographic fault diagnostic tool, which works on a gate level net list. And you can uh, really precisely define your fault model, your adversary model. You can define the location of the faults and the target clock cycles, which you would like to analyze. But the problem is that you have to define an input test vector. And um, this input test vector is used for the analysis, and this can lead to false positives. And in our work, we would like to avoid this, and this is why we propose a new verification approach, which we call Fiverr. And Fiverr consists of these uh, different steps. Here. And in the first step, we use a gate level netlist to build a circuit model, which is done by taking the gate level netlist and translate it to a directed cyclic graph. And for each gate, each input and each output, we create an own node in the duck. Then in the next step, we have to evaluate each node in the duck with the associated Boolean functions. And this is done by binary decision diagrams. So if we um, just take an ex uh, for example, this simple uh, function y here, then we can, of course, represent, it, uh, represent the function by a truth table, or which is done in Fiverr, we are using BDDs. And BDDs represent the uh, function y in, um, this, uh, in this form here. So we have the function y, and then we first would evaluate x0 and decide if x0 is 0, we could directly jump to 0. Or if it's 1, we have to evaluate x1, and so on and so on. And this is done for each node in the BDD, uh, in the duck, so in our circuit model. model. OK, and then. Um, we go into the evaluation phase where we perform symbolic fault injection. And um, let's compare the duck D given here on the left. And then we use a fault model, which can be defined um, by a text file. And we say, okay, we can replace each Boolean function by, yeah, by other Boolean functions. And in this example, we say, okay, our fault model um, considered that we can replace the end gate by an OR gate by a set or reset fault. And then we would replace the end gate, for example, by an OR gate. And this, um, yeah, this leads to a re-evaluation to all nodes that are lying in the propagation path. And of course, the result is in faulty duck D prime. And then in the diagnostic step, we take our golden, uh, or the golden duck D and our faulty duck D prime. In this case, we faulted the XOR gate with a set fault. And then we compare all the outputs by introducing additional BDDs, which are just the XORs of the outputs. And the nice thing is, if we are using BDDs, we can really efficiently count all the ones at the output. So as you can see, we have the same BDD variables at, as inputs in the golden duck and in the faulty duck. And now, if a fault is effective at the output, it um, has to be one here at the output of the XOR gates. And this can be uh, done really efficiently when using BDDs. And of course, we performed some case studies using Craft, LED, and AES as um, ciphers. We um, analyze detection and correction based countermeasures. We can also analyze univariate and multivariate um, fault injections. And just to show you some numbers, for example, if we analyze a single round of Craft with what uh, with uh, which is protected by a countermeasure, which is able to detect single bit faults. And we have to check 766 fault combinations, and this can be done in under one second. And even if we increase the countermeasure, so for example, here we um, attach a countermeasure, which is able to detect three bit faults, then we have to check over 90 million combinations, and this can be done in, 30, uh, in 3,000 seconds. But our tool is also able to pass an entire AES round, as you can see here at the bottom in the table. And again, we um, protected one AES round with a um, detection mechanism, which is able to detect one bit faults. And then we can analyze the entire circuit in 22 seconds. OK, and our tool is open source. You can find it on um, our GitHub slash Fiverr. And yeah, just to summarize, um, our um, so Fiverr consists of these um, steps here. And maybe as a takeaway, we can check over 90 million fault injection for a single round of craft in under 15 minutes while we consider all of the two to the power of 128 bit input assignments. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Um, there are no questions yet on the Zulip chat about this talk. So I'll yeah. ask one myself. 
Um, there's this uh, verification tool for side channel countermeasures called Silver, and it also uses BDDs. Um, mm. Is there um, a possibility of combining the two tools? Mm, yes. So, I mean, it's as you said, it's based on the on the same structure, and um, yeah, currently this is ongoing work. So, um, it's yeah, it's it's probably possible because we start uh, with the same framework, let's say. Yeah. Okay, so we can look forward yeah. to that. Yeah. Um, and then there are still no more questions and we are exactly at the end of our session. So um, I suggest everyone definitely goes to Zulip to ask more questions to the authors. Um, that concludes this session. Thank you for all the speakers. Um, 